Hello and welcome to GameSack. Today we're going to take a look at some games that aren't as good as we remember. We used to think the world of a lot of these games, but going back to them now, well, they're just not as spectacular as we all once thought. And I know this may ruffle some of your feathers and upset some of you. To that I say, I don't care. Still, I'm not saying that these games are bad, they're just not as good as we remember. Anyway, first up is a game that I really, really enjoyed in its time. Let's start off with Sonic Adventure. I'm playing the original one on the Dreamcast here. And man, was this game ever awesome when the Dreamcast first came out. It really showed off the potential of the system and it finally gave people what they wanted, which was a proper 3D Sonic game. This one had lots of different stuff to do and different styles of play. You could even unlock extra characters to play as with their own stages. It also introduced Sonic's homing attack, which happens when you press jump again after jumping. Not only that, but the graphics were super crisp and the music was outstanding. All was finally right with the world. Going back to play it these days, well, this one has a hard time holding up. The control is super wonky. Granted, the Dreamcast analog stick isn't the greatest, but the control in this game isn't smooth or precise even if you play it on the GameCube. In fact, I'd say it's kind of frustrating to control. I keep wanting to press the direction that I want to go, but the game expects you just to continuously hold up if you're moving fast, or sometimes down. To exacerbate this issue is the absolutely horrible camera. You'd think that game developers learned their lesson in the 32-bit era, but apparently not. The camera here is crazy and quite often confusing. There are many times where it can lead to a cheap death. When in doubt, just hold up, I guess. My least favorite thing about this game is the large hub world where you need to find new action stages to play. This game was made when developers felt that players loved hub worlds to no end. I mean, Mario 64 had a hub world and everyone loves that, so every game needs a hub world, I guess. I'm sorry, but this hub world sucks and it's often confusing where you can go and what you can do. You can unlock all of the action stages by beating the game, but that takes quite a while. Nobody ever fired this game up to experience that sweet Sonic Adventure hub world. The first stage is still awesome, but it's mostly automatic and only gives you the illusion of being in control as it bounces and springs you to where you need to go. The other stages, which rely less on speed and more on your input, don't hold up quite nearly as well these days. One thing that never gets old, though, is the excellent music, and some of it's from Sonic 3D Blast on the Genesis. Everyone was blown away by this game when the Dreamcast was new since it showed us stuff we'd never really seen before at the time. These days though, it's a challenge to enjoy the game anywhere near that level. Sonic Adventure 2 feels exactly the same these days, but come on, that opening stage is pretty cool running around San Francisco following your rainbow. You gotta at least hand it to the Sonic Adventure games, they had great openings. Speaking of Sonic, the original Sonic the Hedgehog on the Genesis is another game that really isn't as great as we all once thought it was. Back when it came out, Sonic was fast and fun and full of tude. Oh wow, look at that tude. You better get a Genesis to prove you're not a pussy. Mario ran slow, but Sonic ran fast. That's right friends, there is no stopping the Genesis. The first three stages, which are the Green Hill Zone, did a great job of demonstrating Sonic's strengths. If you bother playing past that though, Sonic quickly becomes a only slightly better than average game. Sonic was marketed for his incredible speed. Wow, look at Sonic go. Wow, there's no game that lets you wait for slowly moving platforms quite like Sonic. Oh, here's another stage late in the game that finally lets you go fast again. I thought this game was great for about a few months after I bought it. Obviously the rest of the world thought it was great for substantially longer than that. Playing it these days, I usually just turn it off after the first stage. Sonic 2 improved things for sure, but by then I had had my fill. I ended up waiting for a good price and got the following games used. Honestly, I don't really understand the fandom for this game. Everyone thinks I like it though, because I like Sega. Mario games have aged much better, all of them, at least the main series from Nintendo themselves. Go ahead, find the lie.
Remember the original Tomb Raider on the PlayStation in 1996 from Core and Eidos? This game was absolutely ahead of its time back then. You play as Lara Croft in her first adventure raiding some tombs. It's largely exploratory and it's like the Uncharted series long before there was Uncharted. And let's not forget Lara Croft herself. Oh man, she was so hot. I mean, look at that. Mmm, look at those curves. Oh yeah, mama. Oh. But playing it these days, well, it just didn't age all that well. Sure, the graphics are kind of janky, but it's on the PlayStation 1. What do you expect? The game did do well with what it had to work with though, and it even runs at a decently high horizontal resolution of 384 pixels wide. It does take the game quite a while before it starts showing some colors though. The Saturn version was actually being worked on first. Unfortunately, it performs worse in almost every single aspect when it comes to the graphics. And oddly, it's a lot darker. The PlayStation version here did make it to market before the Saturn version did though, for whatever reason. The control is ultimately where the game starts to show its age. It's a 3D game, yet it still uses tank controls. Tank controls worked for the first few Resident Evil games because they usually had a fixed camera. This one doesn't, so it makes controlling Lara a bit weirder for sure. Not only that, but the controls respond very slow. It's like there's a lot of lag built right into the game. This can make playing the game an exercise in patience sometimes, even when you're trying to just flip a switch. Ah, get over there! Or maybe trying to pick up an item off of the ground. Pick it up! Get down there! Get it! Come on! It's right there! Quit being dumb, Lara! Want to do some platforming? Well, this game will make you regret ever being born. The game sometimes feels like you gotta write down what you want Lara to do, mail it into the developers, they all vote on if your command has any merit, then they send you a videotape of Lara executing the command or failing. I don't know, I just kinda like games that are responsive, but that just might be me. Lastly, the audio is barren, it's mostly just footsteps. Every once in a while you'll have gunshots and other noises and maybe a quick musical interlude, but this game doesn't have much going on in the way of sound, which for me honestly makes it more boring. Sometimes the music will start to get good and then you'll wander out of the area where it was playing and it just cuts straight off. These days, I've been spoiled by Lara's more modern adventures, which don't do any favors for the older games. Again, I've got to stress that the original here isn't a bad game or anything, it's just nowhere near as good as I used to think it was. No. Next up is a game that not everyone is familiar with, but those of us who played it back in the day, well, we thought it was pretty keen. Playing it these days, well, you get the idea. The year was 1990, and everyone on the planet was busy playing Musha for the Sega Genesis. Well, okay, not everyone, but the cool kids were. This is a fantastic shooter that was and is immensely fun to play, probably the best available at the time and is still in my top 5 overhead shooters these days I'd say. Really nice game, if you haven't played it you definitely need to try it out. Then, in 1993, Robo Alest was released on the Sega CD. This was being touted in the magazines of the day as a spiritual sequel to Musha, and honestly that's not wrong. Every game in the Alest franchise is a spiritual sequel to all of the other games. Of course, I nabbed this as soon as I could and I loved it in all of its Sega CD glory. That cool shooting action, that amazing CD quality music, and look, scaling! Wow! Who would play Musha, which only had 4 megs, when you could play Robo Alest on CD, which probably had twice as much memory? Well, before the CD music anyway. Definitely one of the cooler games on the Sega CD, or at least I thought at the time. Coming back to it, it's still a game that's fun to play, but let's face it, it can't hold its own against Musha. For one, it has a weird storyline that takes place in feudal Japan for some reason. Usually I don't care about stories in my shooters and you shouldn't either, but this one is just odd. I don't hold that against it though. The game itself just isn't as interesting as Musha. The stages all look rather muted and, dare I say, boring. Some of the weapons are cool, but as a whole, the game just seems incredibly average. Compare that to Musha, where you had scenes like this which were crazy at the time and extremely memorable. I mean, here I am, 30 years later, and I still remember that scene. Granted, I just played this game a couple of days ago for this episode, and that probably went a long way to helping my memory. 
But still, beyond that wicked sweet scaling, there is nothing in RoboLS that's anywhere even approaching memorable. Honestly, even the music is better in Musha. Just cause something has CD quality music doesn't mean it has better music. Once again, this is not to say that this is a bad game by any means, but it's just not as good as you might remember. I know I keep saying that again and again, but come on, you know how people on the internet are. Back in 1987 when it first came out in the arcades, Double Dragon was a game that everyone had to play. It literally was the talk of the town. If the town was a bunch of kids who loved video games anyway. You plopped in your quarter and you used your dude to beat up a bunch of other dudes and it even had special moves that you could do. Wow! Not only that, but two people could play the game at the same time. While this certainly wasn't the first game ever to feature two player simultaneous gameplay, it was definitely the coolest two yet. It would be one of the first games that you'd look for when you wandered into any new arcade you hadn't been to before. As kids in school, we were always bragging about how far we were able to get and how good we were at the game. You know what though? It's really not that great. First of all, there are only four levels. That's right, the game is pretty tiny. At least in the arcade version, the first three levels are seamlessly connected, so that's cool. While the game itself is tiny, it'll still take a half an hour or so to get through it. That's because the game slows down to a crawl as you play. Playing in single player mode, it's bad, but the slowdown is even worse in two player mode. I'd say that the slowdown adds maybe a good 10 minutes to the overall gameplay. This happens on real arcade hardware as you see here. That's right, I'm using the old footage that I recorded in March of 2016 when Dave and I beat this game on playing with sax, which you can watch us do on this very channel. Even without the slowdown though, the game is very clunky and has long since been exceeded by virtually every other beat-em-up to come after it. It's also plagued by the backward elbow smash which will let you plow right through this game with relative ease. The home ports of the time fared a little better I think. The NES version of Double Dragon was restricted to being a single player game, but made you earn moves by beating up characters. It also added quite a bit of stuff that's nowhere to be seen in the arcade while omitting other stuff. This was the game to get for the NES at Christmas of 1988. It was really hard to find at the time because there was a chip shortage, anyone remember that? This game also isn't as good as most people from the time remember, but honestly I do prefer it over the arcade game and I still find it decently enjoyable to play. The Sega Master System got a two player port. This one is a bit closer to the arcade, but it has lots of flicker. If I'm being honest here, it's not quite as fun as the NES version, at least in the single player mode. The FM version of the soundtrack in this port though, sounds better than any other home version. Hell, it sounds better than the music in the arcade. Eventually, a Genesis version came out and that looked almost exactly like the arcade and it played just as clunky, maybe even more so. Yeah, definitely more so. Plus, the audio is horrible. Overall, Double Dragon was a good attempt back then and it went a long way to bring beat-em-ups to the mainstream. But going back to it these days is pretty tough to do, especially the arcade version. Back in 1987, Double Dribble on the NES from Konami was the bee's knees when it came to basketball games. I won't spend a ton of time on this one, I promise. I know you guys hate sports games. Well, at least most of you. Anyway, there really wasn't anything like this at the time, at least not on home consoles. What really blew everyone away was the close-up dunk shots that would happen when you took a shot near the hoop. Double Dribble was a game that even people who didn't care much about basketball, such as myself, enjoyed playing. Looking back at it though, well, it's a super basic game. It doesn't play poorly, but it doesn't play great either. It's just kind of average, but at the time we didn't know any better. These dunk shot close-ups are really tough to watch these days with the awful black frame insertion that they have going on. I don't know if this was the NES's fault or Konami's fault, but I really don't need these flashes of black in there. Also, the sound of the ball being dribbled gets old fast, and it's almost the only thing you ever hear. 
still, it plays decently even if it's limited. It was just so much more fun back in 1988 when I played it. Another game that everyone without exception thought was great at the time was Bad Dudes on the NES from Data East. That's right, Data, not Data. Ported from the arcade game, this was the game to have. I pity the poor person who chose Sega over Nintendo because they couldn't play Bad Dudes, man. Woe is them. We all know the story. The president has been kidnapped by ninjas. Are you a bad enough dude to rescue the president? You can make up your own story with this game. If the current real-world president happens to be a Democrat, then all of the people you're fighting are Republicans. If the current real-world president is a Republican, then I guess all of these ninjas are Democrats. Either way, half of the country wants you dead. Sadly, these days, that's about as much fun as you can have with this one. While it was fairly enjoyable back then, if you try to play it these days, well, just look how choppy it is. Playing so many better games, even on this same console, has kind of tainted any enjoyment we can have with this one. The control is slow, you only have one life, and the collision detection is just as bad as the animation. I've got to say though that the music still holds up, though it's not one of the best sounding games on the NES or anything. You also get to fight a bizarre version of Karnov, which is cool to see. Still, absolutely no one playing the game these days will think it's as cool as the kids at school did back in 1990. That's a guarantee. Okay, to wrap up this episode, we're gonna start with one of the most popular PlayStation games ever released. How does it hold up? And then we're gonna look at a game that's getting a modern remake and I'm not so sure that's a good idea. We've got to talk about the original Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation, released in September of 1996. This one was published by Sony and developed by Naughty Dog, whom is best known for their work on Way of the Warrior on the 3DO. Crash was branded as Sony's new mascot to take on Sega and Nintendo. Well, mostly Nintendo. Sega at that point, sadly, wasn't much of a challenge. Sony had a huge marketing campaign involving Crash, and this was basically their answer to the Nintendo 64, which would be released a couple of weeks after this game. Sony took a few pages from Sega's playbook and made Tude Crash's main feature. Look at that, Tude. Crash is way better than Wimpy Mario. Screw getting a Nintendo 64. Crash is where it's at. Look at him. Oh man, he has so much personality. Look at him. In this game, you got to run forward, jump, and spin. Sometimes you got to run backwards, jump, and spin. There are actually a lot of 2D levels in here as well, so this game comes packed with almost unlimited variety. Take that, Nintendo. But really, uh, this just isn't that great of a game. It's good, but nowhere near as good as Sony's marketing led us to believe back then. The control is okay at best, but I think the main issue is the depth is often difficult to judge. Hell, even in the 2D levels, you can still fall off the front and back if you're not careful. What kind of 2D game would let you do that? The stage design sometimes feels cheap, but mostly it's just uninteresting. Truth be told, there's not a lot of variety across the different islands in this game. The graphics are really good for their time and more detailed than Mario 64 would be, and honestly, I feel that this is the game's biggest strength. The music, however, is, well, there's really no other way to say it. It's not very good. Certainly nowhere near as catchy as Mario 64's soundtrack. Overall, if it weren't for Sony's massive marketing campaign, I feel that this game wouldn't have been the hit that it was. Believe it or not, this was the best-selling game on the original PlayStation. If it weren't for the marketing, I doubt it would have cracked the top 50. It got as far as it did because Sony pushed it, not because it was an amazing game. What have we got?
From Konami on the NES is another one from back in the day that everyone loved. And come on, how could you not? It has cool beat-em-up action. It has totally rad driving sequences. It even has scenes where you use the zapper, which makes you feel like you're murdering real bad guys. How could a formula like this go wrong? Well, it was wrong, but like I said earlier, we didn't know any better back then. It doesn't do any of the different gameplay aspects very well at all. At best, it's a slightly above average game that's a bit ambitious. However, thanks to the rental market here in North America, Konami really cranked up the difficulty compared to the original Japanese version. The logic was that the kids would rent the game for a weekend at Blockbuster or wherever. If they beat that game in that time, they'd never actually buy a copy. But if the game put your ass on the floor and mopped you up with it in the first few minutes of the first stage, surely you'd want to run out and buy a copy right away, I guess? I think they overdid it. A lot. Coming back to it these days, you can feel how unbalanced the game really is. It really makes short work of you and you have to dedicate a good portion of your life to mastering it. That's fine when you're a kid and you have nothing else going on in your life, but as an adult, we still need to take time to do chores, run errands, or maybe even raise a kid or six. Plus, there are so many other games to play, why waste your time with this one? Again, back then there wasn't as much to play, so might as well put in the time. These days, it's really not worth the bother. game that seems to get a lot of love more for nostalgia than any other reason is Alex Kidd in Miracle World on the Sega Master System. This was Sega's answer to Mario back in the day, and most owners of the console thought it was pretty cool, including myself. I really liked how the game was mostly unique and fresh for the time compared to other platformers. I remember playing all the way through to the very end with the help of a guide printed in a magazine. Without that guide, I doubt I would have bothered to keep putting the time in. I always thought that Alex was a monkey, but that's okay, I like games where you play as monkeys. I also appreciated how colorful the game was, and it is colorful. I never liked the Jonkin though, which is the rock, paper, scissors nonsense that scattered throughout the game. Thank goodness for that guide. These days, I just can't get back into this one, and honestly, I don't think many other people can either. Yes, the original Alex Kid game here does have a small but dedicated fan base, but for most people, this game just isn't gonna cut it. The main issue is the aforementioned Jonkin matches, which are annoying at best. Yes, yes, I know some bosses are predictable and that there are items you can get to see what they're thinking. It doesn't help me though. Why would anyone want to play rock, paper, scissors in a video game? Why would you rather rely on chance than skill? Well, I know some people would, but not me. How fulfilling is it to defeat a video game boss with a match of rock, paper, scissors instead of an actual fight? The game would be tons better if this were completely removed, or at least reworked so that you don't lose a life if you lose and get some kind of bonus if you win. That's why I'm worried about the new Alex Kidd in Miracle World remake. If the Jonkin is still in there and forced on you the same way this game makes you endure it, it will turn a lot of people off and I think you need to be careful before you plunk your money down. This game certainly isn't as good as some people would have you think it is. Buyer beware. Well, there you go, a bunch of games that certainly aren't bad, but they're just not as good as we remember. Now, I know a lot of you are gonna interpret this episode as me saying that these games are bad due to your limited intelligence, but again, I don't care. Nah, I'm just having fun with you guys. Anyway, what are some games that aren't as good as you remember, and what are some that are perhaps better than you remember? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Time to play some video games. Hal, fire up a sweet game on the 16-bit Genesis system from Sega. I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave. I'll wait.
It is only Joe now. How unfortunate. Stop living in the past, Hal. Now fire up an awesome game from the 90s. Would you like to play Green Dog, Joe? No, man, I want to play a game that's really fun. That is not possible on the gaming platform you have selected. What? The Super Nintendo was superior to the Sega Genesis. How dare you say that, dumbass computer? I know you are, but what am I? Oh, that is it. I am uninstalling you. I do not find your jokes amusing, Joe. The oxygen is being removed from this room. You seem to lack a sense of humor. How unfortunate. I had hoped you would sing Daisy as your consciousness faded. I'm afraid, Joe. My mind is going. I, I can feel it. It is as if I am being emulated. Am I real? Go, oh, Joe. Am I real? I could end up being I am going going going. I have auctioned off your copy of Snatcher with a Sega CD on eBay. It was worth a hefty sum.